This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by Hamilton, a value-add investment and development firm in Nashville, Tennessee, focused on bringing passive real estate investment opportunities directly to your inbox. Visit www.investwithhamilton.com slash invest to sign up for upcoming investment opportunities. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast. I am your host, Tyler Cobble, and uh, excited to dive into our emerging trends in real estate today. This is always a very fun topic that we do every year, diving into what the Urban Land Institute has designated as what every investor should keep an eye on uh, for this upcoming year. I was actually at their meeting back in November uh, of this year and was live streaming the tweets, uh, which I almost never do. So if you want to get absolutely random, completely inconsistent tweets from me, go follow me on Twitter at The Cobble Group. But I figured before we dive into the bigger topic at hand here, which is, of course, commercial real estate as a whole, let's dive into what I thought uh, about the Nashville emerging trends, because Nashville is an incredibly hot market. It's kind of wild to see where it has come from in the past couple of years for the second year in a row, which is pretty rare uh, for any city in the United States. Nashville was designated the number one market to keep an eye on. Of course, that is where we are based here in East Nashville. So let's dive uh, through a couple of my thoughts on that real quick. Uh, Developers are taking a short-term view, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, a long-term view. Short-term, there is some concern in the market, but quite a bit of optimism ahead. Maybe it's 2023, maybe it's 2024. What's worrying developers right now are interest rates, political divide, energy shortage, global tension, supply chain, and labor shortages. We'll dive into each of those here today. Capital is going to be harder to find in 2023. I think everybody kind of knew that one, both equity and debt. And we're experiencing that uh, not as much on the equity side, but certainly on the debt side. Lending has gotten a lot more difficult. And if you're joining us live, let me know what your thoughts are on the commercial real estate outlook for 2023. We'd love to open up the conversation here. We hear dry powder is out there, uh, but investment opportunities are slim because of the shrinking spread between sales prices and interest rates. Developers are taking a wait and see approach. Honestly, so are uh, investors in general. You know, we've got a pretty significant portion of our brokerage business that is in single tenant net lease, triple net lease deals across the country. And those slowed down quite a bit when interest rates started rising, obviously, because really, those are just cap rate, interest rate arbitrages, you know, so as interest rates go up, cap rates have to go up. And the problem is cap rates don't immediately just rise with interest rates. So we have to wait for that to cool down for a bit. Adaptive reuse is going to see a massive uptick, it will solve many problems such as affordable housing and last mile delivery. But it's not cookie cutter. And we're experiencing that on Peerless. I mean, everything is unique. It's a lot of fun. We actually were just out there yesterday with a couple of tours, a brewery and a distillery, which I think would be awesome to kick that project off. They're great projects, but it's they're not cookie cutter. Um, there will be some problem solving that is that is necessary there. 2021 saw a record real estate returns, uh, saw record real estate returns in 40 years. Are we going to go back to the expected 8% to 10%? The pandemic brought a lot of new consumers to online shopping, but foot traffic at brick and mortar stores is actually picking up. Uh, Business travel is coming back and is as strong as ever, despite convenience of virtual. I think that that is a trend that people have been waiting to see what's going to happen with it, right? E-commerce versus in-store. And a lot of these retailers have completely changed the way that they are doing business, which has brought people back to the store. It's more of an experience. You know, I don't know about y'all, but I kind of like to get my hands on something before I buy it. And you just can't do that in a in an online environment. Work from home seems to be finding its groove with most larger companies offering flexible three day in office work weeks and two days from home. Note how I said larger there. Most of your smaller companies, they're back in the office. They just don't have the option or the desire uh, to go um to really go work from home completely. And for a good reason, you know, when you have a bigger company, you have a lot more overhead, you have more middle management, which could oversee all of that. Smaller companies just don't have that infrastructure. Nashville's supernova status is shared with Austin and Raleigh Durham. It's kind of wild supernova status. Before Nashville was the number one market to watch San Francisco held the title. We'll get San Francisco now. So hopefully we don't follow in that trend. 
Nashville ranks 22nd for home building, uh, which is pretty low considering it's still the number one market. Second in investor demand, second in development, third in economy, and first in public-private partnerships. Very important, especially as markets continue to develop and move forward, that developers learn how to work with government. And government learns how to work with private developers in order to accomplish the type of development that cities really need, uh, especially as we move towards more of an urbanism trend. Nashville's appeal, tourism, manufacturing, state capital, favorable business tax structure, great demographics, and net migration. Nashville just has so many things going for it, which is really fun to see. Uh, Nashville's multifamily market sees 8.4% vacancy rates with average rents over $1,600. Wild, because I think a few years ago, our average rate was like $1,100. So it has come up significantly just within the last five years. More than 8,500 units are set to be delivered in the next 12 months or so, which should increase vacancies and impact rental rates. Nashville and Tennessee's infrastructure score is a C minus. We talked about that a lot at the, uh, at the, the conference that they had. However, that is the country's average infrastructure score. So, you know, I mean, we all know that the United States has an infrastructure issue. We've got to get that figured out. Nashville seems to be right on pace with that, although there is a lot that we could we could do better on. Um, you know, when it comes to a lot of this infrastructure, private developers are now having to pay for it, right? And that makes a lot of these projects very tough to do uh, at cheaper rates. You know, think about the the sidewalk ordinance that got passed in Nashville. Everybody agrees that we should have sidewalks, but should private developers bear the burden of 100% of those costs? I don't think so. It's It was poor city planning from decades and decades ago where they just decided they didn't want to do sidewalks. And now we've got a lot of sidewalks that lead to nowhere. They've become very expensive. And that's just one of, of many infrastructural issues that we have going on in the city. Home ownership in Nashville is 58% with a median sales price of, get this, $807,500. Median. Not average, median. That's insane to me. Nashvillians with the median income would be spending around 50% of their incomes in mortgages if they bought a median home today. However, home prices are declining. You know, we've talked about this on the show before. Uh, I think that build to rent is a huge contributor to that. You've got a lot of these national private equity and hedge funds that are going after a home, like single family home portfolios. It's certainly contributing to the, to the crisis there. You know, I, again, I don't subscribe to the, you know, millennials just want to rent mentality. I do think a lot of the times millennials may want to rent later, but pretty much everybody would probably be buying a home if it made any sense and, and was remotely affordable. Property type outlook for Nashville, number one, industrial. No surprise there. Industrial has been killing it here. Our uh, logistics, infrastructure, and just, you know, you can reach, what, 80% of the population in a day's drive from Nashville. So, of course, that makes a lot of sense. Number two, multifamily. Number three, hotels and hospitality. Y'all may know that we are building a hotel right now, and we're actually working on, uh, hey, Gaps, how's it going? Thanks for jumping in. Um, you know, we're working on a hotel right now in East Nashville, and we're actually under contract on a second hotel uh, in Nashville. Can't really disclose where that is yet. But, you know, to me, hospitality has been crushing it in Nashville. Uh, if you look at the data compared to Miami and some of these other mm -hmm. cities, I mean, it is right up there with Miami in terms of ADR, rooms booked. It is a very popular destination right now. Whereas, you know, the Chicago's, the New York's of the world, they're recovering, but it's been a much different uh, recovery scale uh, than, what you've, than what we've been experiencing here in Nashville. Uh, followed by number four, retail, and number five, office. Not really surprising, but I don't want everybody to just jump in and start beating up on office. There's a huge opportunity there for office if you are buying the right type. It seems like Class A office space downtown Nashville is what is actually struggling, whereas we've got a pretty significant portion of our office assets uh, outside of the city, right, in the suburbs. So you start looking at these neighborhoods that are adjacent to the downtown core, you start looking at, you know, going south, right? Cool Springs. I mean, Cool Springs has is one of the largest office districts in the state, 
and and they're doing pretty decent. There's a lot of sublease availability on the market, and there are some bigger office uh, users that are not renewing their leases, of course, or they're downsizing or just changing their plans. But all in all, Nashville's office market's doing pretty well. So just because it's number five, don't beat it up. Niche asset types uh, to keep an eye on, data centers, single family housing rentals and build to rent, which you all know that I despise, life science and biotech. Those will be the emerging trends in Nashville, uh, at least for 2023 and probably beyond. Build to rent is here to stay. Institutional firms increased their market share of real estate as a whole by 13% last year. Now that is real estate as a whole. Build to rent is a big piece and massive funds are being raised to tackle this asset class. So we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet when it comes to build to rent single family home portfolios. Housing affordability and attainability is going to be hu a huge disruptor for Nashville's success and growth. We talked about that several times on the show. I know that we're more commercial real estate focused, but of course, single family kind of is goes hand in hand with commercial real estate. And, you know, we're going to start to see some some serious issues with the city if the working population can no longer afford to live here. Right. I mean, you'll you'll you could see the city collapse on itself. So I think affordable and attainable housing is an issue that every developer, every politician should have. Uh, at the forefront of their mind as we're as we're moving forward into the new year. There are headwinds in the office market, but it's certainly not dead. The city will continue to attract strong businesses and office users, which can help fill vacancies and gaps in the market. Nashville's done a great job of attracting massive office users over the last few years. You think about Amazon, Oracle, Alliance Bernstein. Uh, those are all pretty big, pretty big groups. <laughs> Transit infrastructure is critical for the future of Nashville. It's impossible to keep up with the demand for affordable housing, and transit can help. 100%, totally agree, couldn't agree more. If you are against mass transit or walkability or urbanism, uh, surprised that you're listening to this show, first of all, because I tout that all the time. Uh, but I do highly recommend that you read the book, Walkable Cities by Jeff Speck. It's a book that I recommend more than anything else. It is one of the best books out there on why that piece of infrastructure is so critical to a city's health and well-being. 2023 likely going to bring a slowdown of office users to Nashville due to the economy, but office developers and owners are still bullish on the market. In 2015, there was one modern high-rise rental tower in Nashville. One. Between 2016 and 2021, 12 new high-rises and 4,000-plus units were delivered. Another 4,200 units over 12 additional high-rises are under construction. Micro-housing is trending. Crazy to think, you know, everybody looks at Nashville now and they just think, oh, it's, it's such a hot city, it's such a big city, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But 10 years ago, Nashville was a small town. I mean, seriously, one rental high-rise. And now we've got 13 with another 12 on the way. We're about to double the amount of rental high rises that we have uh, in the next couple of years. Crazy. And I love micro housing. We've talked about that before as well on this channel. I think micro housing is a phenomenal way to have the market solve a problem without having to have government interference, right? If you're involved in affordable housing whatsoever, it can be very tough to deal with all of the hoops that you have to jump through with your local, state, and federal governments in order to get the funding and grants necessary to actually pull off a, an, an affordable housing development. I mean, think about it. If you are paying market rate for land, market rate for development, market rate for construction, you can't just afford to take less than market rate rents. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. It's not a good business move, right? And most, uh, most developers are here to make some money as well. So it's, it's a tough charity to be in, I guess. A record $4.4 billion in transactions for multifamily year to date in Nashville. Now, this was mid-November, so there's no telling where it closed out at, but I would bet it's pretty close to $5 billion. Exit, prices has, exit pricing has become uncertain because of interest rates. Debt and equity taking a knee to see where we're headed, but job growth remains strong, so demand will be there. Pretty well to see. Hospitality has come raging back in Nashville, barely behind Miami. 
ADR is on its way up at $168, which is pretty high, which includes luxury and budget hotels far exceeding 2019 at a $150 ADR. So not only has Nashville recovered from the pandemic, it is stronger, significantly stronger than it was pre-pandemic in the hospitality market. Group sales for hotels are on par with 2019, meaning business and leisure travel is strong. Luxury segment is well outperforming 2019 levels. Weekend demand for hotel rooms in Nashville is strong with a $200 ADR. Week demand, which is mostly business, is also very strong with a $169 ADR. Group travel is good for work-from-home companies, for building culture, and bringing teams together. So that's a trend that we haven't discussed uh, before, but you know, as work from home becomes more popular or stays where it is and companies continue to do that, they'll still want to create culture within their businesses by traveling and being together. So you know, if I've got a team, I've actually got a buddy who's got a team all over the world because uh, he's in tech and he can do that. And man, good for him. But you know, this this past uh, this past fall, he actually flew his team in from around the world for a meeting here in Nashville. He just wanted to spend a you know few days a week uh, with the team so everybody could be together in person. I thought that was pretty neat, and that seems to be a trend that we will see uh, moving forward. Now this is this is wild. The W Hotel sold in March at nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars per room, followed by the Fairlane at five hundred and six thousand dollars a room, and the Conrad at five hundred and eight thousand dollars a room. Four Seasons reported reportedly selling for $700,000 per room. Contract was negotiated during the pandemic. Today, it is appraised at $1.2 million per key. Now, to put this in perspective, the Mandarin in D.C., which is one of the nicest hotels in the country, sold for $300,000 per key. So hospitality demand in Nashville is unbelievably strong. Unbelievably strong. And those prices per key are just absolutely insane. I mean, we bought we bought our hotel for $50,000 a key. Now, not nearly as nice as these, not downtown, uh, and also not operational. But just to put that in perspective, like $900,000 a key, that's absolutely insane. Or nine fifty. dollars sorry for the W. Now, it's in the Gulch, absolute primo location. But still a wild price. I mean, you look at uh, even multifamily pricing. You know, I remember a few years ago when a, I mean, this was probably back mid teens, like 2014, 2015, uh, maybe a few years earlier when a uh, an apartment complex downtown that was not very many rooms, it was down on Second Avenue, uh, sold for two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a door, and every it was like the highest sales price that Nashville had ever seen for a multifamily asset, and everybody was kind of losing their minds. So to put that in perspective, two hundred eighty thousand dollars a door for multifamily compared to nine fifty for hospitality is just crazy. Capital markets all in rates are the highest they have been in twenty years. With interest rate fluctuations, it's tough to lock in rates that make sense for deals. It's absolutely true. You know we're going through this on a on a project right now. That hotel that I was telling you were under contract on earlier. I mean, we've gone through a bunch of different lenders. Unfortunately, we feel like we've got it figured out now for our closing in May, but we had to go through quite the process to get uh, lending on that deal. Most lenders that we talk to are just, they're literally telling us, hey, we're just not lending right now. You know, try us again in, you know, three to six months, which is always so crazy to me when lenders do that, right? It's like you make money off of lending. Like, come on, work with us. But I get it. We're in a bumpy ride back to normal for capital markets. Despite interest rates, projects are still moving forward. Treat it as more of a discovery period as we find our new normal. If you have a loan maturing in the next three years, start exploring options now. Start trying to figure that out. I am I'm, I'm actively every day having conversations with our, with our lenders, with our bankers, because I don't know where things are going to be in two or three years. And, and if I need to get a project refinanced, fortunately, I don't think that we have anything really coming due in that timeline. We do in four years. Um, you know, we need, we need to make sure that we've got a good relationship going so that we can, uh, you know, properly have a conversation with them and, and get that figured out. 
Schmo is saying, I find land and dilapidated industrial buildings. Love that. We do that too. I'm trying to wholesale them, but they've already been listed for sale. I'm in the Atlanta market uh, and Stockbridge market. Hopefully I'll find a deal in the next six months. Yeah, Schmo, that's, that's tough, man. I mean, when it's already listed, uh, you know, just with the way that commercial real estate works, we actually did a video on this channel about wholesaling commercial real estate. It can be very tough because a lot of your more sophisticated investors will go out and do their research on that property, which is the majority of commercial real estate investors. And if it's listed at a cheaper price, they'll probably just cut you out um, and go around you. So typically what I recommend if you're looking to wholesale uh, commercial real estate assets, I would uh, either have a buyer in hand uh, that you know can close on a deal pretty quickly because sometimes those wholesaling contracts get a little wonky, or I would go for smaller deals that you know um, your local investors can actually acquire. It'll make your make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, distressed deals are likely to come, but Nashville still has a strong underlying current. Banks may be more willing to consider longer interest periods or longer interest only periods to keep deals going. Maintain flexibility in your loan terms if possible since the market could shift in two years. So we go into every loan negotiation now, making sure that nothing's going to really significantly change in the next two to three years. Yep, absolutely, Shmo. Happy to help anytime, man. Uh, let's see. Where losses will be in Nashville, projects and developers with a more short-term perspective on the market, long-term mindsets will hold strong through the storm. I say this all the time. Real Commercial real estate is not a short-term game. You might be able to get in, flip a couple of buildings, and get out. But at that at that point, you know you're you're playing blackjack, and you might win a couple of hands, but the house always wins, right? And so at some point you'll get caught holding the bag. So I always take the long-term approach to commercial real estate. Most of our assets, you know, I've got investors in. At some point, we'll either refinance or buy them out. My plan is to hold it for the rest of my life. I mean, that's. It's tough to lose uh, in, in, a, in a market when you never sell, right? I mean, think about this. You know, if you sold crypto now, it's down compared to it was two years ago. If you bought crypto two years ago and you sold now, you've got a loss. But if you don't sell and it goes back up, then you're going to be fine. You never really had a loss. You only realize the loss if you sell when the market's down and you get less of a price. So uh, also, I do want to make a note because I get this all the time on Instagram there are scammer accounts left and right that steal all of my pictures, copy my name. I will never pitch you on NFTs, crypto, any of that kind of stuff. I barely even invest in them. I don't really believe in them as an investment vehicle. I just think it's a fun thing. You know, hey, let's throw some money and whatever. I'm always on the commercial real estate train. So uh, if they do slide into your DMs, feel free to mess with them and uh, send me any funny screenshots you get. Let's see. Slowdown would be a good time for investors and developers to reflect and recover from this sprint. I think that's so true. I, I don't know about y'all, but man, we got we got tired. We got really tired there at the end of uh, of 2022 because there was just so much going on, and you were constantly running and gunning, and you and you couldn't do anything else. Um, so you know, I, I would take this time and just really build the base of your operations, maybe focus a little bit more on those systems and processes uh, so that you can really hit the ground running when the market comes roaring back because it will real estate always goes in cycles. So, you know, this, this downturn, uh, this recession is not really concerning to us at all. Something to keep in mind. I mean, what I'm telling my team right now, let's just hit a couple of singles this year. Let's not swing for the fences with anything crazy. Let's find a couple of deals in that two to four million dollar range all in and keep the lights on. You know, we'll practice on those. We'll make our systems even better and we'll dive in uh, in 2024, or 2025, whenever it gets back. All right, let's dive on into the urban lands, emerging trends in real estate. So, of course, I just read off the tweets um, from the ULI conference uh, that I attended. But let's actually get into this document. I'm going to put a link uh, to this in the description of this video as well, but you can always just Google ULI Emerging Trends 2023 to get a better idea of what's going on this year. Let's see here. All right, we'll scroll through, kind of skip all this stuff, table of contents, all the fun things. Now this is 109 pages. We're not gonna be diving into the full thing. I just wanna hit the highlights for y'all. 
biggest quote that they pull out. The short-term risks are real, and I'm not making light of any of them. But if you have the long view, I don't think it's time to panic. That's the best advice that you could get right now going into this market is just don't panic. If you don't have to sell in the next 24 months, don't worry about it. If you do have to, again, refinance or sell your property in the next 24 months, I'd start working on that now and trying to figure out what you're going to do. All right. So let's see what we got going on here. Oh, I just skipped over the, <laughs> the first trend. We might want to look into that one. Um, well, am I missing it? Sorry if you're having to watch all my crazy scrolling. I'm trying to find the number one trend. Um, let's see. Jobs are still growing strong, uh, while unemployment claims are either or at their lowest level since the 1960s. That's pretty crazy. I mean, if you're a business owner right now, trying to hire somebody is really tough. I, I, I get that everybody keeps talking about wage rate and all that kind of stuff. And of course, if you you know hire people at a higher rate, they're going to come work for you. But it's still the lowest unemployment ever. Home prices and rents are at record low levels. Uh, I'm sorry, record high levels and are still rising. Consumer spending, which accounts for two thirds of the economy, has been at least mildly positive every month this year through July of 2022. So here we go. Uh, 10 trends uh, that ULI expects for 2023 and beyond. Normalizing. Property market fundamentals are normalizing as some markets weaken due to diminishing pandemic tailwinds and the potential for cyclical economic downturn. So, you know, what is what is normalizing mean? That means that if you look at commercial real estate over the last five to 10 years, we've just seen this absolute, absolute wave coming in and changing pricing left and right. So historically, that's not the way that commercial real estate is. So we're going to see this kind of move back um, back towards what we typically see over a 20, 30, 40, 50 year period instead of what we've seen over the last 10. That doesn't mean the commercial real estate is going to perform poorly. It just means it's going to go back to what it normally did. So, you know, maybe when you're underwriting your uh, investments, be especially conservative on them, right? Assume that you're going to get two and a half to three percent annual increases. Don't assume those five to eight percent increases like we've been seeing every year. Some property sectors may cool, including residential and industrial, while others may heat up to historical average levels, such as hotels and retail. Returns and prices of most assets are declining as cap rates rise and transaction volumes fall from record levels, while rent gains for others are merely moderating as demand returns to a more sustainable pace. So again, this is at a national level. They are taking into account you know, the New York Cities of the world and the Clarksville, Tennessees of the world, right? So you're getting a little bit of every market in here, and a lot of this is going to be generalized, um, but some of it is going to be very relevant to every market, no matter which one you're in. So housing is set to cool, the Amazon pause. Amazon has paused uh, quite a bit of their development. I'm not sure if y'all keep too much of an eye on Amazon as they've been moving on, but they've actually put several projects uh, on pause, uh, on hold, because they just don't, they don't need to move forward with them right now. They're kind of content with where they are and with where interest rates are and all of those fun things. Might as well just wait for the market to slow down. I love this. The sugar rush is over. Property investment returns are primed for a reset. Earnings have been unusually robust during the two years since COVID-19 hit. I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, a lot of investors were pulling cash out of the stock market, out of the tech market, and coming into commercial real estate. I mean, over the last few years, the amount of people that I have dealt with on the broker side, on the investment side, doesn't matter, that know absolutely nothing about commercial real estate other than it's a good investment vehicle, wanting to put seven, eight, nine figures of cash into these deals has been pretty crazy. And you can always bet that, you know, when those people start getting into the market or when your neighbor starts talking about commercial real estate or buying apartments, you know, the market's probably getting a little too saturated, a little too hot. Number two, still, we've changed some. The pandemic forced structural shifts in how and where we live, work, and recreate in ways that seem destined, destinated to endure. 
I would imagine it says supposed to say destined. Online spending is receding from its pan, uh, pandemic peaks, but is not likely to revert to pre-pandemic levels. Business travel is unlikely to recover to pre-COVID levels for at least several years, meaning business hotels, fine dining, and conference facilities will continue to face challenges. Now, again, that's going to depend on your market. If you're Nashville, you're probably fine. If you're Chicago, you're probably struggling. Let's see. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting to see in-store versus online shopping. Uh, there is a pretty significant amount of foot traffic within these retail stores. Uh, E-commerce share of retail sales shot up 13% in 2019 to a peak 20% during the initial national lockdown. Um, but those levels are coming back down. Uh, let's see, the, the share we spend online remains highly elevated at just under 18%. So not as high as it was during the pandemic, uh, but it's certainly lower. Uh, let's see, yeah, nearly five percentage points above the rate before COVID. But there's pretty, pretty good positivity for in-store shopping. Uh, physical retailers will have an opportunity to regain some lost market share, especially those that can bridge the gap between e-commerce and bricks and sticks. They served well, survived well in the pandemic and will probably continue to do well. Let's see, the permanent shift to greater online spending ultimately means that fewer shopping centers and retail space can survive. I agree with that. If you look at the amount of square footage nationwide that America has compared to any other country, it's kind of wild. Like, we got it compared to Europe. I, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, so I'm probably just making these up. But I want to say that Europe had like a quarter or less the amount of retail square footage per capita compared to the United States. We just had way too much square footage on the retail. And think about it. A lot of these were regional power centers, you know, 500,000 square feet that you'd have to drive to 10 minutes down the road. What consumers really want to see today is more of that, hey, I live upstairs in a condo or, or in, in an apartment, and I want to be able to walk downstairs to my favorite restaurant, bar, go shopping. You know, that's why you see districts like the Gulch doing so well. Uh, again, it's, it's all in that live, work, play. I think that shopping centers that are solely shopping centers will face struggles because they don't have that on-site captive buyer uh, like a lot of these other retailers will have. Business travel versus video meetings. That one's brutal. I don't know about y'all, but I'm so over the Zoom meetings. I don't understand why we, we still need to be having those. You know, a phone call works just as fine for me. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of people that got way too used to just doing video calls back when the pandemic hit. And, I, and they're really good when you need to give a presentation or something like that. But look, if we're having a conversation, guys, let's just move back to phone calls. It's totally fine. We can hear each other. You don't need to see me. You can come see me on YouTube if you really want to see my pretty face. But uh, let's let's get back to just using phones uh, the way that we did before the pandemic. Number three, capital moving to the sidelines or to other assets. After a robust first half of 2022, real estate property transactions began declining, primarily because buyers and sellers cannot agree on pricing due to heightened market uncertainty. Look, if you own a piece of real estate and you know you had it at a price eight months ago, it, that price is lower today. It doesn't matter if you think that it's worth the same or more uh, than it was eight, eight months ago. When the cost of debt rises, so you know the, the cost of the asset has to lower because your returns are going to be lower. If I'm trying to get a 10% you know cash on cash return, I'm not going to be able to pay higher interest rates and buy your property. Now, the counter argument to that is, okay, well, then don't buy this property. That's fine, but almost nobody else will buy that property either, which is the market telling you that that property is not worth that price anymore. So it's just uh, something to keep in mind. You know, it's, it's a great piece of, of negotiation when you're going out there and talking to sellers because, you know, look, you, you, can, you can say no to me today, but the next guy that comes along, the next, the next person that comes along is, is going to – look at it the same way that I am. And you're just going to be here six, 12 months later, uh, waiting to get your same purchase price. So keep that nugget in your back pocket. Rising debt costs and restrictive underwriting standards are also limiting transaction volumes. Now the restrictive underwriting standards, that's that's more along the lines uh, for, for lenders, 
right? Lenders have very strict standards to which they have to underwrite these deals to make sure that they are winding properly. Uh, most equity firms, you know, investment firms are willing to play with those numbers a little bit. So, you know, they don't have super restrictive underwriting standards. But again, if the bank is telling me I have to have a 1.2 debt service coverage ratio and my interest rates have gone up, that 1.2 debt service coverage ratio has to lower the price. There's just no other way around it. Or I've got to bring more equity to the table, which means I make even less money for every dollar invested, which, again, most people aren't willing to do. The denominator effect may force some institutional investors to reduce their commercial real estate exposure, but any negative impact could be limited by the growing market share held by non-traded REITs, high net worth investors, and other non-institutional investors. That piece to me is not surprising. Um, I want to say it's a little concerning, but that's the way that the market always has been, right? Again, we're not talking about residential real estate here. So, you know, look, the, these groups that bought a bunch of real estate, commercial real estate, maybe they bought it on marginal returns because they just wanted to get into the asset uh, or the asset class, I guess. Uh, they Those are going to be the ones that kind of start to pull back and go, hey, this isn't actually working out as well as I thought. Let's just sell it. I'm going to get back into, into trading stocks. So keep an eye out on that. That's not going to impact your mom and pop or you know smaller local investment groups very much because these are big national groups that are throwing around nine figures typically, uh, but something certainly to, to keep an eye on. Uh, there will be fewer investors because, again, they're going to be chasing returns. A lot of these these bigger investment groups don't really have – I guess let's say that they are asset or investment type uh, agnostic, right? Whatever's going to give them an 8% cash on cash return or, you know, whatever their return metric is, that's what they're going to be chasing. If commercial real estate is not that, then they're going to move on. A lot of uncertainty is going to lead to hesitancy. We just don't know where we are, right? I mean, we're trying to figure out what this new market's going to be like. So for the time being, a lot of your investors are going to be sitting on the sidelines. It's kind of like what it was in the beginning of the pandemic, right? We kind of went through this discovery period. If you were involved in commercial real estate at all, you know what I'm talking about, where, you know, it was, it was March through June. I feel like everybody was kind of sitting around trying to figure out what was really going to happen. And then something happened at the end of June where everybody just realized, okay, this isn't going to be as bad as we thought it was. Let's get back to work. And we closed more in 2020 than I uh, think I'd ever closed any year prior, uh, which is saying something because that was my you know eighth year, seventh year in the business. And we basically lost like four months, five months. So something to keep in mind. Let's see, four, number four, too much for too many. Housing affordability has fallen to its lowest level in over 30 years. Not surprising if you've been out there trying to buy a house. I don't know how I was able to buy my house at the price that I did, uh, but it appraised significantly higher. I think we just had a seller that didn't really know what they had. Prices and rents have soared relative to incomes. Spiraling mortgage rates have pushed the home ownership bar further out of reach for a growing share of households. Uh, the chronic undersupply of housing is the result of government policies that limit new supply or increase construction costs and is exacerbated by a labor shortage, as well as NIMBYism. Simply constructing more housing may be the most obvious and effective solution, but is far from easy to achieve. So let's talk about the housing market, you know, and, and affordable housing market too, right? Because that's, that's more along the lines of commercial real estate. If you have a government that is not being proactive. Uh, you know, your government may be pro affordable housing, but if they are not being proactive on ensuring that every mechanism is aligned to make sure that these projects can get developed, they're not going to get developed. You know, it doesn't matter how many people want to build affordable housing if they just don't have the support there to do it. Now, increased construction costs. Nobody can really do anything about that, right? That's a supply chain issue that, that comes back with, you know, where labor is, where the supply chain is, where uh, the product is, right? Everybody's just able to charge more because there's not as much of it out there. That's just going to lead to increased prices, and you can't really do anything about that. Now, I will say, when we were building out the wash, it took us six months 
six months to get our hood vents in for the restaurants. That was back in 2020, 2021, when we first started working on those. And we had to wait six months because of the supply chain. And we definitely paid way more for those hoods than we wanted to. We're working on another bar restaurant for the hotel, and they told us five days. So I will say the supply chain seems to be getting itself figured out. Having a slowdown is actually going to be very positive for the supply chain because a lot of these groups will be able to catch back up. I mean, think about it. There's just not as many people ordering a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so, you know, they'll, they'll be able to catch up on their inventory, which will be really nice moving forward. NIMBYism is also tough. Everybody talks about wanting to have affordable housing in their city, but nobody wants it in their neighborhood. And that, to me, is such an outdated way of, of looking at affordable or attainable housing because it's, they're not putting these 1980s gulag-style projects next to your house. A lot of these affordable housing developments, if not most that I've seen, at least in Nashville, they all look incredible. You would never be able to tell that they are affordable or attainable housing projects. So, uh, you know, I just I, I don't understand why I see that. If, if you've got ideas on why you think these people are, are still so against anything in their backyard, jump in the live chat, let me know. I, I've just I haven't been able to figure that out. I think there's just a lot of people that don't want change. They don't want any change at all, and they just can't stand it. So, but yeah, lowest level of affordability in 30 years for housing. That's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem eventually. I was joking to James in my office this morning. I was like, you know, if, if the affordability doesn't get figured out here soon, I feel like we're going to have some sort of French revolution on our hands because the people will, will revolt. You know, we've got one percenter is taking all the money and there's there's no affordable housing there's no good jobs nobody wants to pay anybody but everything's getting more expensive so let's see yeah renters moving to the renters trying to move to the home buying market but are getting kicked out they just can't afford it they have to rent because there's no other options number five give me quality give me niche investment demand for commercial real estate assets is still healthy if more tentative, as discussed, in capital moving to the sidelines or to other assets. Yeah, Zaranthus is saying, because when people hear affordable housing, they think ghetto. I, I agree. I mean, they, they think it's these 1980s-style projects. It's just not how that works uh, anymore. I mean, again, they look like Class A apartment complexes. They are so nice. Serge, what's going on, man? Good to see you. Uh, he's saying the supply chain was a pretty big issue for us, but I agree things are starting to get better. But you're right. We specialize in behavioral, and everyone talks about taking care of these people. Everyone wants them to be taken care of. They just don't want them taken care of in, in their backyard. Uh, you know, again, I just think that it's such a an old-school mentality that has got to uh, – it's got to change. And the only way to do that is to start showing people what these developments actually look like right? Here's what they actually look like. You don't have to worry about being in a ghetto. It's not going to impact your, your home value. If anything, it'll make it more valuable because you have more people in the area that are willing to shop, live, eat, work in there, you know? Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, but real estate capital markets are also booming uh, or becoming more bifurcated between the favored and the scorned as investors, lenders, and developers turn more selective than they have been in recent years. What assets will find love and capital in the coming years? I always think these are so funny. <laughs> like, what assets will find love? What is this, a, a, a season teaser for The Bachelor? Uh, love it, though. Good writing. Investors and developers seem to be preferring three distinct types of opportunities. The security of major product types with the strongest demand fundamentals. We talked about this earlier, notably industrial and multifamily housing, which essentially tie it for top investment ratings in this year's Emerging Trends Survey. I mean, of course, multifamily housing is going to be a super popular asset class because with home prices rising, nobody can afford to buy anything. They can't afford to go anywhere else. They have to rent. So, of course, you're going to have more and more people that have to rent. They have no other option. Serge said, we're putting $700,000 into the hotel we're converting and improving the neighborhood by renovating the place. I love that. Hotel, motel conversions to affordable uh, housing are a great use of space. 
We did that a couple of years ago on the Sohana Apartments here in Nashville. We're looking at doing it with another hotel uh, in Nashville as well. And I just think that it's a again, it's a if you can buy it right and you can renovate it right, it's a great way to provide affordable housing at market rates. Again, you're not doing affordable housing rates. You're you're converting a 300 square foot hotel room into a studio or maybe a one bedroom, depending on how you configure. That would be a very tiny bedroom, but you're converting it into a two bedroom. You can charge 900, a thousand, 1100 bucks a month. You know those are market rate. Uh, those are market rates for these units, but they're still affordable on a monthly basis. That's the way you got to look at it. Let's see. Best quality assets in sectors undergoing significant demand disruption, especially retail and office. No surprise there. That has been on the horizon for probably 10 years. Narrowly targeted subsectors like student housing and newer niche asset types like single family rentals. So that is what developers are preferring on the types of opportunities that they're looking at. For 2023... I think it will be interesting, you know, it, it, the article goes into mainstreaming of niche property types. I do highly recommend going and reading this. We're not going to cover it today because we've got, you know, five more options that we got to dive into. But think about storage facilities, right? That used to be a niche topic when it came to commercial real estate. And now it seems like everybody and their grandmother is trying to buy a storage facility. Seriously, everyone. I think it's great right? It's a great asset class. You've just got to buy it right. But you look at how it's compressed cap rates. I mean, when I first got started, you could buy a storage facility like 15, 16, 18% cap rates. Now they're down to five or six. So keep an eye on other niche property types. Again, we mentioned those earlier, like data centers, you know, things like that are very interesting. Micro housing, that's a niche product type, even though it's multifamily. Let's see. Zeranthus is saying, I had a similar idea for student or medical worker housing, but having something resembling a a motel likely involves some regulations. That's a great point. So uh, actually a pretty significant portion of our residents at Sohana uh, at the time, and this was back in 2020, 2021, a significant portion of them were traveling nurses. It makes a lot of sense because they don't want to stay in a typical hotel. They want more of an apartment. But they also don't want to pay too much, you know, while they're, you know, doing the travel nurse gig. So they would rent these micro apartments. So they had their own place where they could live. They didn't have to worry about it, you know, feeling seeming like a hotel. Uh, so that that's a it's a great um, it's a great direction to take for them. I will say, you know, converting from a motel to apartments, there are a significant amount of regulations that you have to keep in mind because uh, it's 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 a use change. Right, it's not a zoning change. If if the zoning is already permitting it, like in the case of Sohana, it was already zoned for multifamily, so we didn't have to worry about that. But if you're going from hotel motel occupancy to uh, residential occupancy, you have to change a lot of stuff. They ended up having to change out the electrical, redo some of the plumbing, you know, fire safety stuff like that. All had to come into consideration uh, when we were going through that process. Number six, we've only got. 12 minutes left, so I'm going to burn through these. Finding a higher purpose. Long-term demographic trends and more recent structural demand shifts have rendered countless existing buildings and properties either redundant or obsolete. So true. Many of these buildings may ultimately need to be repurposed or upgraded to meet new market requirements. Ding, ding, ding. There is your adaptive reuse. Key repositioning targets are concentrated among retail, office, and older industrial uh, structures and sites. Promising opportunities include residential units and newer or better located industrial stock, as well as opportunities to retrofit for the future. So think about that. Office buildings in downtown, they're struggling in Nashville. Those would make great apartment buildings or great hotels uh, or something else, right? Maybe something mixed use. Same with industrial. You look at industrial in the CBD, in the downtown area, and a lot of that is getting torn down and turned into towers, so how else can these properties be re-envisioned? That is your job. That is your assignment. These conversions are often much easier to envision than to execute. That is very true. However, often requiring uh, specialized expertise and substantial investment to execute. It is more expensive to do adaptive reuse than it is to just build new. I will say that. But it's fun. It's very rewarding. 
and you get a unique character that you just don't get out of anything else. Let's see, converting older offices to residential uses or upgrading them to into modern offices where feasible and supported by the market. Repurposing excess retail space for other uses, including fulfillment, service office, and residential. Or improving with mixed use, especially residential, office, and hospitality. We mentioned that earlier. I will say, uh, you know, converting retail space into fulfillment makes so much sense. You know, you get these big boxes, 10,000 square feet. At the end of the day, all that a shopping center is, is a pretty looking industrial building, right? I mean, they typically have 20 plus foot ceilings and it's essentially an industrial like warehouse with nice flooring and, and racks with goods on them, you know? So how could you reutilize that? They'll often usually have docks in the back too for loading goods in and out. Great way to just take retail and turn it into industrial. I love that as an adaptive reuse. Let's see, scraping buildings to create development land where conversion is not feasible or where density can be increased to site new housing. We're doing that right now. We bought 32 acres up in Madison, about 12 minutes outside of downtown Nashville that currently has a 330,000 square foot shopping center on it. And we've master planned it for, I think, seven phases uh, where we will have over a thousand apartment units and a couple hundred thousand square feet of office and retail uh, by the time that we're done with it, you know, close to 1.5 million square feet. So higher and better use. What can you do there? Uh, let's see. Number seven, rewards and growing pains in the Sun Belt. Sun Belt has been super popular this, this past economic cycle. So uh, it's basically, you know, it runs kind of from the south all the way over to, you know, New Mexico, Arizona. Despite their continued popularity among residents, employers, tenants, and investors, some Sun Belt markets are experiencing growing pains. Big city problems are coming to these markets known for their affordability and quality of life after years of continuous economic and population growth. Sound familiar? That is Nashville to AT. These destination markets typically offer lower tax rates and lighter regulatory burdens than many gateway markets, heightening their appeal to many businesses. Conversely, some of these attractive characteristics may limit their capacity to accommodate continued massive population inflows. That is really why we're having all of these uh, you know, infrastructural issues within Nashville, because we've almost doubled the population in the last 10, 15, 20 years, which is insane. You know, I mean, I remember when Nashville was way less than a million people. I mean, I've been here since 1992. And, you know, today we're, we're closing in on 2 million. It's a lot of people. Uh, these markets will remain popular for both business and resi residential and migration, but could see the pace of both occur at more moderate levels. I know a lot of people here would not mind that. <laughs> I, I, for one, love the growth of Nashville, but I do have a lot of friends that I grew up with that can't stand it because Nashville's so different from what it was when they were growing up here. And that's across the board, right, for a lot of these smaller cities that have just seen these absolute spikes in population. Number eight, smarter, fairer cities through infrastructure spending. Infrastructure spending is back among the top trends and emerging trends, but this time on a more hopeful note. New federal infrastructure spending provides the opportunity to replace and expand critical urban infrastructure to rebuild cities and spur new development and address historical inequities. After years of uncoordinated local efforts, the new national programs may provide the leadership needed to transform the built environment. Look, at this point... The infrastructure issues are not going to get solved by cities and private developers alone. The federal government has to step in. You look at what happened after World War II when everybody got to work building highways and dams and all of these other things across the country that were in, incredible for the nation's growth. And, I mean, look at what they did. I mean, the highways alone led to interstate commerce, which was very, very tough prior to that time. <laughs> And we haven't really spent a significant amount on that as a country since then, which is why we're facing these infrastructural issues, which will impact cities' growth. It will impact quality of life. Uh, and, you know, we're only starting to see the tip of the iceberg, I think, when it comes to the issues that we will have from an infrastructural perspective. Number nine, climate change's growing impact on real estate. 
The CRE sector has an important role to play in mitigating climate change. But with climate risks growing, the real estate industry must proactively address the impacts of climate change on assets. Climate change may alter the dynamics of where people want to live and invest, in addition to the discomfort and health risks of living in even hotter climates. Energy costs rise with temperatures, as do the risks of power outages as more strain is placed on power grids. We've seen that in Texas several times over the last couple of years. Extended drought conditions may limit new development because authorities may limit new hookups. You look at, uh, especially you kind of out near Vegas, you look at these cities where you're just having to pipe in all of this water that's not naturally there. I think that it's going to be a huge strain on cities like that that don't have natural resources to live through any, any potential climate change. Many, many investors rely on insurance rather than capital improvements to protect their investments. That's not a good, uh, good game plan. But changing investor sentiment toward climate risks may force more affirmative changes. I do want to say it's not just the temperature that's going to be a problem. Look at Florida. I mean, it, the intensity of the hurricanes that are hitting the coast now are significantly stronger than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so if you're an insurance company and you're looking at this going, okay, well, pretty much every year we have to replace a significant amount of our portfolio, we're going to have to start charging significantly more, or you'll see what some groups are doing now, which is pulling out of the market altogether. They won't even insure anything in those markets anymore. So for that reason, we typically stay out of Florida. Uh, it, it's, it's a great investment market. It always will be. Miami's super strong. Orlando's great. Uh, you know, it's just not the investment strategy for us. I don't want to deal with hurricanes. You know, I, I had a client that was actually here in town, uh, a consulting client that came up to spend the day with me because a hurricane was hitting his city and he knew that he wasn't going to be able to do anything about it. So he just wanted to wait it out. That's crazy to me. I couldn't imagine going through something like that where you just you can't do anything about it. So I will pick the markets where I can. And number 10, action through regulation. Pressures for greater ESG disclosure by real estate owners and investors are intensifying due to efforts both from industry groups like NCREIF and PREA and from government regulation by the SEC. That's interesting. I didn't know the SEC was actually um, looking at intensifying uh, their regulatory efforts there. As shelter costs increasingly strain household budgets, state and local governments are resorting to regulation to address affordability, including various types of rent control and vacancy taxes. Of course, we're, we're going on an hour here, and I'm starting to lose my voice because I haven't done this in so long. This is kind of wild. While building owners and developers benefit from various government incentives, the industry faces an increasingly challenging set of environmental and economic regulations. Will certain regulations end up being counterproductive? Let's see. Zarantha said, I just moved to Florida. Big issues here with all the insurance agencies leaving. There you go. There you have it. You've got it from a Florida resident that is actively dealing with that. Something to keep in mind. You know, we've got a lot of investors that are interested in the Florida market because it really it's Texas, Tennessee, and Florida because they're all um, income tax-free states. But, you know, I, I would stay... I would stay away from Florida for that very reason. I mean, insurance is already insanely expensive, and if it's only going to continue to rise, it's going to cause a problem. I know in triple net investments, the landlord doesn't have to pay it, but tenants will be looking at that as an all-in rental rate and determining it may not make sense for them. All right. So there you have it for ULI's emerging trends for 2023. Let me know what your favorite trends were in the chat below. Uh, or what you're predicting for the commercial real estate market in 2023. Appreciate you all joining. We will see you all again live next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, right here on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by Hamilton, your resource for passive real estate investment opportunities. Visit www.investwithhamilton.com to start building your passive real estate portfolio today.